Welcome, everyone. My name is Shin Erno, and I serve as the Director of Curatorial Research at the MA Practice Program at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. On behalf of Stephen Henry Meadow, the chair of our program, and myself, <clears throat> I warmly welcome you all to the fourth talk of the fall semester 2023 in our series, The Algorithmic State. Each month, we are honored to bring you thought-provoking dialogues with distinguished professionals in the artistic and cultural domain. This series explores the intersection of contemporary art, science, and technology, examining the societal, philosophical, and environmental implications of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Today, for our talk, The Power and Peril of artificial memory, I'm truly thrilled to introduce two pioneers in their fields, artist Rafael Lozano Hammer and curator Kathleen Ford. Rafael Lozano Hammer is an internationally celebrated artist who utilizes digital technologies and machine learning to craft art that invites viewers to engage with memories, both individually and collectively. His works explore the promise and challenges of artificial memory production. He's recognized for being the first Mexican artist at the Venice Biennial in 2027 and has received numerous awards, including two BAFTA awards and the Governor General's Award in Canada. Kathleen Ford, a renowned curator in time-based art, intersects performance, exhibition, and technology. She currently serves as senior curator at Super Blue and faculty member at the SVA. Kathleen has curated notable exhibitions of Raphael's work and collaborated with various prestigious institutions, including a large-scale solo exhibition of Raphael at Borisan Contemporary in Istanbul, where I met both in person for the first time in 2013. In today's discussion, Raphael and Kathleen will illuminate Lozano Hammer's machine-mediated practice, focusing on his recent work using trackers, recorders, generators, as well as their implications for surveillance, collective memory, and border politics. The conversation will, <clears throat> so sorry, the conversation will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by a session for collective discussion, where we strongly encourage you to submit your questions via the Q&A feature for the concluding segment. Please note that this session is being recorded, allowing you to revisit the discussion at a later time. Whether you are joining us live now or watching the recording later, we are excited to have you with us on this intellectual journey, exploring the dynamic landscapes of human intelligence and profound insights derived from our ever evolving machines through Rafael Lozano's work. Thank you very much, Kathleen and Rafael. I'm very excited to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I mean, first of all, Ishan, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, I've had the uh, privilege of working with Raphael many times over the years. I think we know each other for maybe 20 years now. Ah! Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with that said, uh, you know, it's a real honor to be here today in conversation with all of you and with my friend, uh, Raphael Lozano Hammer. Um, okay, so onto the topic at hand. This great title that Ishin came up with, The Power and Peril of Artificial Memory. Um, I read that title and I wanna add poetics to it. So the power, peril and poetics of artificial memory, which I guess is also continuing the alliteration, <laughs> which is not, never a bad thing. Um, but I say that because Raphael's work um, is often looking at or observing the landscape of machine learning, artificial intelligence, surveillance, on the one hand, from a critical perspective uh, with a nod to paranoia and maybe threat, but it's <laughs> uh, always rooted in humanity and also in hope. So hence poetics. Um, we're gonna be, the three of us got together and decided to you know, look at this uh, thread of his work and practice from uh, three different categories, uh, recorders, trackers, and generators. Um, and we got these from, if you were to look at Raphael's website, he kind of had these metadata tags for all of the work that he makes, that all, all living under these kind of different buckets, and some of them live between many, but trackers, recorders, and generators are, are three of those categories or descriptors, uh, which uh, really kind of populate the conversation that we're meant to have today. So 
Um, we're going to talk about those. Rafa is going to speak to each of those chapters for about 10 minutes or so each and present work within them, some conversation between. And we'll make sure to save room at the end so that all of you can also ask questions and continue the conversation. So with that, Rafa, I think I'll turn it over to you um, to speak a little bit. To, I think you're starting with trackers. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> I'm very excited to be here, um, specifically trying to present um, the works that engage with an algorithmic or an artificial memory of sorts. Uh, we can go ahead and, and try and define it here as just understanding that the work with technology is never uh, neutral, that the work with technology is always a collaboration, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, very literally or just metaphorically a collaboration with everybody who has been mulling over interfaces, algorithms, and, uh, and platforms, um, or uh, actually a collaboration in the real world with others. Um, I really uh, would like to just mention that I, I am an artist who has been working with uh, technology for a very long time. And sometimes um, when, I, when I think of AI, um, I'm thinking about very practical uses of AI. And we will see some of those in the, in the uh, panorama that I've prepared for tonight. But it's true that we're living in a moment where a lot of people are thinking of AI and they're thinking, you know, something like DALI, you know, they're thinking about mid journey, they're thinking about the generation of, um, of imagery based on trained data. There's a little bit of that. But if, um, if we understand it so narrowly, then this is not uh, a, a good talk for you. I mean, I'm thinking very expansively about uh, how um, we can generate uh, unpredictable behavior from a computer. So um, we're going to start by sharing my screen. And can you confirm that you can see this? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, yeah, as um, Kathleen said, I've divided this the presentation to three sort of main approaches. The first approach is the idea of making uh, presence intelligible for computers. So in 1991, right after the first Gulf War, we heard the first usage of this so-called intelligent smart bombs. The smartness of these bombs was basically predicated on the idea that they can take executive override decision over what is the target that's being uh, sought after. So they don't they didn't need to be told precisely what the geolocation was, but the bomb had the capability to make certain decisions as to what its target would be. And I don't know if you remember or maybe you don't because I'm old, but um, famously, one of these smart bombs hit the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, I believe, uh, during the ex-Yugoslavian war. And uh, there, is, there is a concern over how we give executive control to these machines. At the time, also in 92, uh, Manuel de Landa had just written War in the Age of Intelligent Machines, which is a wonderful, wonderful recount of the sinister usage of this executive uh, control that computers had. And this piece was very simple. It's uh, the first piece I ever made. And is this eye that follows the performer uh, around the room. That one was done with originally ultrasonic tracking by Will Bauer, and then later um, with computer vision, which we will see a lot of. Um, the, the usage of this computer sentience um, is important in most of my work. Um, this project is called Subtitle Public. Um, my God, I can't believe it's almost 20 years old, but it's literally an empty room where you see nothing. And as you walk in, the computer finds you. So what happens is um, it gives you a word that is sticky, that follows you wherever you go. The word is any of um, the languages, verbs conjugated in third person, bites, sleeps, murders, or so on. And then once you get one of these words, it's uh, not easy to get rid of it. You need to touch somebody else in order to exchange words with him or her. Um, the, the spirit of this project and why I'm showing it as a tracker is a lot of the um, 
interest uh, in my studio with um, AI in general, well, specifically in AI right now, is to do with being able to give awareness of the artworks of its environment. So what you're seeing here was actually a tracking system um, developed um, using firewire cameras. Oh, by the way, the person on the top has the word institutionalizes. The one in the bottom has the word marries. And so you'll see how institutionalizes, they touch and institutionalizes goes to this guy. And now he gets a new word. So this, this work um, is, is meant to be, um, yeah, a representation of, of the tracked space of, of surveillance. And um, back in 2005, we were doing this with, um, with uh, 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 originally with five wire cameras, and it was just blob tracking. Today, this is now done um, with connects. So in other words, with uh, structured light, something that's a little bit better. But the latest version of this project, uh, when we show it next, is going to be all done with AI segmentation. So basically, computer vision has advanced to the point where a simple camera can very accurately tell you the location of people um, just extracted with um, this capability to, to, to have training over what does a human body look like. So there are just a very large number of libraries that my studio works with to try and detect people. Similar, but with facial recognition. So back in 2015, as you may know, 43 students were um, kidnapped and potentially murdered um, by supposedly by the Guerreros Unidos cart drug cartel. Uh, that's the official story. But in 2015, when this happened, we heard that there was no forensic evidence that the um, official story was real and that the community was still looking for these um, 43 disappeared students. So we made this artwork called Level of Confidence using Eigen, BPN, and Fisher, which were at the time reasonably good face recognition algorithms. And basically, as you stand in front of this mm, display, it uh, calculates what is the proximity to any of the 43 students in the database. And then it tells you who you look like the most. And it also tells you our level of confidence is only 17%. In other words, result student not found. The spirit of this project is that um, it's not an artwork, it's more like a campaign. It's something that we, uh, you can download for free from my studio. This has been shown now in almost 100 uh, universities, galleries, libraries, uh, art centers, all throughout Mexico. And the spirit is just to keep the search alive, right? How can we use or misuse technologies that are sinister, like face recognition, to try and create empathy, to try and create links um, to uh, these disappeared? And in a way, it makes the search internal. It looks, it, 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 it tells us that we could have been the one disappeared, that there is a fraternal link with them. Um, importantly, the project um, is also uh, open source. And this is a project that we are uh, currently reprogramming uh, with uh, researchers in Argentina to look not for the 43 students of Ayotzinapa that disappeared, but for the over 30,000 disappeared during the Argentinian dictatorship. And this is, of course, particularly important at a time when Millet, um, who denies the the existence of uh, of these disappearances, or at least the the magnitude of them. Um, basically, he's like a fascist, um, has taken power. Um, so those are the trackers, the ways in which the computer can... Can, can I also of... maybe jump in Absolutely. with a, a yeah. question that, uh, yeah. just something that occurred to me when I was watching uh, lots of these works unfold. It, I had the feeling that it's kind of like there's nowhere to hide. Uh, in a way, it's it, like like AI. It's, it's not optional anymore. I mean, and even with sort of, I think it was the second work that you showed where you had the text uh, put upon you that you, you can't hide from it. You also can't choose it. Maybe what happens if you get a word that you don't like? I'm just wondering if that sort of resonates with you. Very much so. In fact, that's a funny anecdote or, well, funny to me. 
uh, we had an important uh, politician come to the opening of Subtitle Public in Mexico, and uh, he went ahead and got the word masturbate, um, which is, uh, you know, like I told him, it's like, this is all the verbs, not some of the verbs. Mm -hmm. And he was very uncomfortable with the word masturbates, um, you know, following him around. And then I showed him how he could wipe off the 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 word onto somebody else and then he got the word coordinates and he was really happy with that <laughs> so yeah there is a degree to which the artwork at least subtitled public tries to render tangible the surveillance that is um around us mm -hmm. but it also in this particular occasion tries to make it into a relational you know interaction in other words not just like oh we're we're doomed we are, um, you know, kind of always under surveillance and this Orwellian narrative. Of course, there's that. But then there's also a certain connectivity, right? There is a feeling of, yeah, you're in a game now, and it's a game of observation about who is the observer and who is the observed. Um, crucially, you can't read your own word. You, you, you find it difficult because of the angle. And so you need to ask somebody to tell you what your word says and establishes relationships at the gallery that I think are, are fruitful. Um, but definitely, yeah, like the, the, the message that we are in a society of metrics and that this is inescapable and that even the Unabomber or whomever who happens to be in a very far away place and disconnected, they're still part of the apparatus of, of technology to the degree that we live in a technological culture, for example, globalization, that we cannot opt out of. Um, so I think um, it's not that I'm defeatist, but I do think that on the one hand, that the message that that this technology exists and is pursuing us at all times is still not old, <laughs> mm -hmm. that we still need to emphasize it, especially as we go into, for example, Facebook, and we think that this is like a plaza, when what's clear is that these are curated choices, often algorithmically for us, to derive a particular optimization of capital. So. Um, you can never it go wrong. Also, it's unique, though, to track trackers as opposed to recorders, by and large, because going into recorders, we'll see that you actually have the possibility to opt in or to kind of observe the installation, where in your trackers <laughs> category, you, you don't have that option. Yeah, I don't, sometimes there's no option in recorders either. Like, <laughs> so we'll see, it's on a per case basis. But but yeah, you're right. I mean, I think this this idea of opting in is a really complex uh, idea, right? Oftentimes we, we think that things are optional, but I have long acknowledged my own partial complicity with what I denounce. Uh, there is a degree to which my artworks are actually replicating the policing that is taking place in culture at large. And, and I, I, I think it, it doesn't stop me uh, from doing it to the degree that I think that there are contributions or fissures that we can look into to try and create spaces, um, spaces that are, uh, well, no, again, not neutral, but have a certain kind of autonomy. Um, but that's a that's that's for a different type of of uh, of dream, which is a utopian dream. Um, so among the works that you don't have an option, I mean, you have the option not to go into the room. But um, this is a recording, a recorder of the more sinister kind. This one is um, basically a collaboration with the great Polish American artist Krzysztof Wojciechko. And uh, he was telling me that in communist Poland, where he grew up, there was a set of rules about how far away and for how long you needed to be with somebody in public space before the activity was flagged as suspicious or even illegal. More than three people in public space could not come together. So in 2015, we made this project called Zoom Pavilion, which measures the distance between people. <clears throat> and... <clears throat> Basically, it it materializes the this 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 communist uh, Polish communist uh, rules about uh, assembly in public space, and then the recorded the recording wall. It's all the interactions of different people who have spent time in the same room, 
um, together. So you see yourself with a bunch of strangers or uh, family members, and it tells you how far away you were from them for how long, and, it, and then it categorizes your presence in relation to that interaction. So this kind of work uh, is not unlike the trackers that we saw before. It's uh, the, the particularly um, uh, problematic part of this project is that we're actually recording. We're actually uh, keeping track of who's there. I should mention that all recorders um, are meant to be temporary captures of presence. So you are there until uh, new participants come in and then the oldest recordings get erased. So there is a constant erasure that goes into it. And I would love it, Kathleen, if at the end of this talk, we could talk about erasure because it's a really important part of my, of my practice. Yeah. So that's a recorder. Um, I came up with another recorder that's uh, quite popular in my work. This is uh, what we call pulse topology. It's basically every single one of those light bulbs is the heartbeat of a different participant. I chose this more recent version. I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years, but I chose this more recent version because we're actually using computer vision with a, a little bit of AI. Um, when you put your hand underneath it, it actually, first of all, needs to segment the hand and learn whether the hand is, in fact, a hand. And if it is, then it does photoplethysmography with computer vision, which just means that it measures tiny variations in the coloration of your skin in order for us to be able to extract your heartbeat um, from your hand and then be able to illustrate that heartbeat with sound and light in this you know, huge array of light bulbs. So this piece with light bulbs is... Um, it's to me interesting because you're using the AI to capture biometric data and then, so you use the light and then you're using the light as well to represent it. There is a, a, a certain continuity between the, 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 the two that I, that I think is successful. And we've been doing this pretty much everywhere. Um, this is what you're seeing is in Toronto. This one we just did um, a month ago in the Durham Cathedral in England. This is a, a beautiful 11th century cathedral uh, in uh, Durham. And um, again, the shape itself of the whole sort of chandelier is made out of an electrocardiogram. The valleys that you can traverse are there. And then the sensor just kind of detects your heartbeat and adds it to the array. Again, the question of erasure is a really important one in a recorder such as this. One of the things that's interesting about recorders is that it's a bit humbling. If no one participates, then there's nothing to see. There is, uh, there is no art because the artwork is basically the flow of information, in this case, biometric information that connects you to the building and to the, and to the topology. Now, I Finally. also wanted to ask you, yeah. uh, maybe this is a quick point to do so, about in your mind the difference between the collective and the connective. I know that oh. often when I talk about these kinds of works, Pulse in particular, I've talked about it being sort of the power of the individual becomes even more powerful as a collective or a group. And yeah. and then I do also remember you you let me say that publicly <laughs> recently, but I do rem I do have memory, speaking of memory, of you saying to me that you actually prefer connective rather than collective. Yes, Can you speak yes to that? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the name of collective, I'm from Latin America. So in the name of collective um, uh, properties, the, some of the worst crimes <laughs> have been committed. I don't like collective. I think collective comes from uh, this tradition of thinking uh, in a very homogeneous way about, um, about people. And um, Connective, which is something that Derek de Kirchhoff underlines as opposed to Pierre Lévy, which is so Pierre Lévy is collective, and then uh, Derek de Kirchhoff was connective. We're talking about like 90s theory now. But in the 90s, I thought that that was a really important distinction. Um, connective allows disparate planes of experience to have like a bridge between them. 
but it does not make any kind of extrapolation or averaging or uh, you know sort of breakage of the singularities that makes us us so absolutely this works i would say are connective they're not collective um ishan um wanted me to um talk a little bit about a project that i did in uh Sydney, Australia, and before that in England and the States, um, that is inspired by Charles Babbage, um, the, the inventor of the first mechanical computer. Here we see his calculator, the difference engine, but then he designed the analytical engine, which was a programmable computer that famously Ada Lovelace was the first software programmer for. And one of the things about um, Babbage, especially when we're thinking about recorders, is this beautiful book um, from 1837 called The Ninth Bridgewater Treatise, where Babbage basically posits that as we speak, we create turbulence in the air. And that what would happen, he asked, if we had a computer that was so sophisticated that we could rewind the motion of all of the atoms of the atmosphere and in such a way to recreate all the voices from the past. So to Babbage in this book, the atmosphere was a vast library that recorded everything that we ever said. Um, and so he imagined that in the future we'd be able to hear the voices of long lost loved ones, or we'd be able to hear the, the languages that are now extinct. And in a particularly important passage of the second edition of this, he adds a, a paragraph where he talks about slave owners getting away with murder and that their deeds are being recorded in the atmosphere and that one day we would be able to play back their deeds as evidence of wrongdoing and seek justice. It's just, it's a, an unbelievable text. So out of this, we made an artwork that tries to, um, you know, replicate or somehow simulate a world in which everything is recorded. And I don't have time to go over all the 10 pieces, but I'll show one of them. Uh, actually, I have a, a little ad that just I'll play back. It's just a one hour teaser. I mean, it's serious. One minute teaser. Zoom presentation. That's rude. Um, but um, this is what I wanted to show you, which is basically a piece that uses um, a Tisney. So this is like a multidimensional comparator of people. So anyone who is in the actual uh, projection chamber gets tracked in many different ways and then classified according to uh, proximity. So of all the different algorithms um, to evoke, to use, or to misuse, um, a Tisney is a particularly problematic one. I mean, a Tisney based on, on appearance is a particularly problematic one because then it's uh, genuinely attempting to make generalizations over what it um, looks um, at. And then of course, crucially uh, makes incredible mistakes. Some of these mistakes are beautiful. Others will prevent you from entering your country or others will take you straight to prison. So I think that from the perspective of the atmospheric memory show on recorders, this particular recording set is um, some of the more ominous stuff that we've made at the studio. 
Mm, and then I'll finish. Having an interesting yeah. conversation about this, though, I'd like to bring up again, uh, yeah. which is also not just about sort of recording but also about predicting. Is that right? I think it had something to do with Derrida and how you kind of predict what somebody right. might say or how they might feel about a certain socio-political situation because you know them so well or have such an archive of their sort of humanity and ethics at your fingertips. I was wondering if you maybe you could um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, actually it was Bakhtin. So Again, back in the day when I was reading a lot of theory, I was really into this idea of the intersubjective. And uh, you will see this played out, play out um, among a lot of AI people. They will tell you, we as humans ourselves are program. So, you know, and I like that position. I, I like, uh, I dislike people who um, dismiss AI because it's just you know, pre-trained with everything that, uh, you know, that has been digitized and, and placed into the archive. Because there is, from Bakhtin's point of view, this intersubjectivity, which means we are made out of what we ourselves have read and the language that we use. And as you and I are having a conversation, there is this continuity between you and I, but also different types of speakers who uh, are in the back of my discussion with different types of speakers in the back of yours. And this this understanding of, say, communication as, as, a, as a network or as a more fluid, more complex, uh, irreversible set of conditions is, is fascinating to me. And, um, and, and I think that um, we we try to make an artwork. We we're still trying to make it. It's called Immediate Future. Um, this is I don't know when must this must have been twenty years ago, Kathleen or something. I don't know. Anyway, the oh, point yeah, yeah. is that, that was like ten yeah. years ten years ago. Yeah, ten years ago. Okay, so Immediate Future was basically or is going to be basically a, a piece where the training of the AI is not based on a, a, a larger um, archive, a, 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 an enormous uh, model, but rather on a very, very, very partial, very recent model. So when you look at a lot of media art, it's about recent memory, things like my pulse topology or my pulse room. It's about, oh, there are people who are here are recording their heartbeat, and then you immediately see the recent past. A lot of uh, recorders do that. It's it's all about the recent past. But what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to extrapolate into the future. And that is something that, of course, it's very common in AI, especially in, in, in things like DALI and so on, because you're when we speak about these machine hallucinations, you know, what we're talking about is how do we take all of this material that we've seen from the past and then extrapolate into the future? Now, whether what that extrapolation is, um, is it useful? Is it political? Is it aesthetic? Is it uh, valuable? You know, I mean, I think it depends on a per case basis, but uh, for immediate future, all we're trying to do is predict where you will be in the future. And, um, you know, like I want to know 120 milliseconds into this future, you know, extrapolate the trajectory that you're ha you're having. And then if you change your mind, boomerang your projection back into yourself. So we'll we'll succeed. But um, yeah, that's a deep cut, Kathleen. So <laughs> um, so the, the last recorder I want to show is this one. Uh, during COVID, I lost two friends um, and. Uh, to be honest, part of the really difficult part of losing people was that because of social distancing, you couldn't go and join funerals or wakes or mornings or visit in the hospital or anything like this. And I think that without the closure, there is there's a particularly resilient trauma uh, that stays. And um, what we did at the studio during it is we made a little memorial, so to speak, uh, it's an online piece called A Crack in the Hourglass. It's still operational. It's, it's a crack in the hourglass.net. And what happens in this project is that we use hourglass sand to draw very laboriously and slowly um, the pictures, the likenesses of um, anybody, family member or friend that you have sent over the online version. 
So uh, on the, the online website. So basically here is our old, um, this now looks much more beautiful, but this is the, the thing that we made with the equipment that we had at the studio at the time. And then once a particular portrait is drawn, you can see that there's actually a number of cameras that are broadcasting this so that people from different time zones or different geographical regions could log in to see the gradual drawing of this mandala-like entity. And the spirit of the project was on the one hand to have that live broadcast, but also to have an archive uh, recorded uh, of the actual action. This is AI to the degree that we're doing this um, segmentation, this extraction of background and finding of faces and so on and so forth. The most important part of this project though, is that once your particular um, drawing is made, we would tilt it robotically and recover all of the sand. In, other, in, in order for us to be able to reuse it for a future. So we have like almost a thousand portraits of people. And um, to me, this particular recorder is again, um, a, a manifestation, maybe it's a ritual, maybe it's, uh, it's something that helps us have closure. The fact that all of the portraits are made with the very same sand is critical for me because I feel like art is really good for mourning, uh, for dual, uh, duel, uh, duel, uh, anyway, uh, for, for mourning, but it's also really good for continuity to sort of represent that, you know, the sand keeps flowing, um, new, endless, potentially, uh, number of formations will happen into the future with the sand and um and yeah so this recorder and again the issue of erasure right like i think that the project is successful uh, not because it manages to make an image i mean this is this is technically no not so complex nowadays but because what lasts is that this image is fleeting that this image is unreliable that we now are left with the memories and the feelings we had of these lost lost ones. Lost and this ones. is why your work, as you often say, is often kind of seen almost more closely through or accurately through the lens of performance than it is visual art, because there is that mm. ephemerality to it. Absolutely true. Yeah. yeah, I agree very much. And it's, a, it's an interesting problem also for visual artists, right? I mean, we're at the School of Visual Art. I mean, if what you're trying to do is stage a disappearance, then how can museums collect your work, right? And um, the answer is that the performative is a set of instructions that can be re-performed. So for example, the work that you just saw, um, it ended up being at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, what we did is we built the, a beautiful, um, you know, sort of sand, uh, sand clock uh, uh, device and we put it in a kind of altar and we've and we had this photography of all of the people who have participated so you would enter into a space where the performance was happening and where these pictures would constantly be um, uh, transformed or exchanged to give you that sense of flow so this project is now going to um i want to say north carolina i, I can't remember right now but uh, in the spring Okay, and then the final section is the generators. Um, for the generators, I mean, there's, you know, so many different types of, of, of approaches. But in the year 2000, we made this artwork uh, called 33 Questions Per Minute. All it is is permutations and combinations. So I would not be calling this AI, but very much in the tradition of um, automated poetry, um, the project actually knows how to conjugate verbs and add adverbs and so on, but it actually generates 33 questions per minute, which is the threshold of human legibility, but they don't make any sense. Most of the time it says things like, will you bleed in an orderly fashion? And once it asks a particular question, it never repeats the same question uh, again. And so at least the English version of this, it goes on to 55 billion years. Uh, it's never gonna repeat the same question. And the spirit of this project is to, um, you know, create a certain kind of noise 
But um, importantly, this project was premiered at the Havana Biennial where the internet was um, forbidden for Cubans, but not to Mexican Canadians. So I got an internet connection and I uh, made it so that anybody could write their own text and put it in the automated flow of questions. And when I did that in Cuba, I thought, okay, well, people are going to express themselves because it's impossible for the authorities to know if the question was made by a person or by the, uh, or by the algorithm and in a way subterfuge and be able to camouflage their questions. And sure enough, people started saying stuff that they normally wouldn't say, but it wasn't political, which is what I wanted. It was mostly you know, sexual stuff is like, hey, baby, come here, I'm going to do this to you or whatever. And it was kind of surprising that the the project took that turn. But I like that. I like when I'm wrong about how the outcome is going to be, especially in a generator. You're it's seeing interesting how much of your work is, you know, kind of also in and around prediction, as we were just talking about. Yeah. Uh, and yet you have no control. <laughs> You've kind of given yeah. up the monopoly of the artist and you cannot predict what the outcome is, you know, as you're just saying in, in a case like this. I, I love that, yeah. So I often say that my work has two features. One is that it's incomplete. In other words, it depends on the observation, the participation of the visitors to exist. And then second is out of control. And by that, I mean out of my control. So um, I think that there's something really attractive about a work that has uh, a set of behaviors that emerge. And I think that that's one of the things that is uncanny, but also fascinating about AI. This is a work, and now this one really is 20 years old, which is using a very simple algorithm, which is a type of cellular automata that normally this is represented with dots of black and white uh, in, a, in a grid. But here is these uh, Kawama beer bottles that are on a cantina table. They're being seeded by the algorithm. And then sometimes the connection between the, the synapses, if you will, or the, or the actual bottles is interesting. Other times it isn't. And at, at that point, we reseed uh, the project. So this is an example of a kinetic sculpture that does not have um, a, a score that does not have a behavior that can be predicted. It's all emerges from the algorithms that we use for it. Um, and uh, let me just fast forward. So this, in that sense, that's a generator because it's algorithmically derived, not in interaction, but it's interaction just with time and the math. So that's uh, Synaptic Kawamas. Um, more in the tradition of what we think of now as as AI uh, image generation, we trained an AI with, uh, I don't know, 400 bottles of water, um, branded water. And uh, we asked it to invent its own versions of uh, water. And what's interesting is in this clock that only counts to 59 seconds, in this clock, we are looking at... Um, at some brands that you look at and you go, oh, yeah, I, I, I know that water. But then the other ones, they also look completely faithful. The, the fakeness is so good. It comes up with, with the colors and the, and the ridiculous names, you know, Arctic purity and things like this, um, in order to create rarity, in order to create a sense of of something that's expensive and, and difficult to get when what you're doing is just basically, you know, commodifying the commons, you know, you're taking water and converting it into a property. And um, of course, this goes with that famous statement by the CEO of Nestle, who said that water is not a fundamental human right. And he would say this because he owns, you know, San Pellegrino and Evian and uh, many other um, uh, brands. So in any case, if you were to look at frame by frame, which are the bottles made, you would notice that a substantial amount of them is just this filler that, uh, that the AI has created. Um, fun with AI is not just um, the possibility of, of um, 
of training a data set, but also having it perform. And uh, and in this tradition of, of automation, you know, that that harkens us back to the 19th century, this idea of the automaton, uh, we made this artwork with, with the mortuary mask of Mexico's incredible poet, Ignacio Ramírez de Nigromante. So this is his house in San Miguel de Allende, and you can go and visit his actual mortuary mask. And as you do, you arrive and the mortuary mask is there illuminated. And then when you approach it, the computer knows that you're there and this happens. So he's, se puede matar a los so he's saying uh, dead people don't speak. And then he tells you one of hundreds of different recordings that I have. And he asks you a question. For example, he just asked me if I am afraid uh, of my death or death in general. And once he asks you a question, he disappears. And your own face gets mapped into the mortuary mask. So this is me saying that I'm afraid of both my death and death in general. And once you've um, spoken, it disappears and it presents itself again as a white uh, mortuary mask. And then anybody can come in and, and have a different experience with this kind of oracular uh, imagery. Now, this is awful, um, you know, because you're, you're kind of... Be creating this puppet into the future, right? But this is not unlike what's happening, of course, right now in Hollywood after the strike, where, you know, the, the capability that we have to give uh, an extension of supposed life into the future is uh, something that is really problematic. And the reason we're doing it with El Negromante is because his family, um, you know, offered me the mask in order to make an artwork out of it and they have a sense of humor. I'm gonna skip these ones because they're not as fun. And um, I have just two more to show. One of them is uh, a lot of a lot of the work that we are doing that I think is algorithmically interesting has to do with fluid dynamics. So we are very curious about using fluid dynamics and different types of irreversible equations and generative equations to create never repeating patterns of animation. In this particular case, you're looking at the compounded works of Stuart Hall, the philosopher, British Jamaican philosopher, uh, who in 1973 wrote uh, Encode Decode, the, basically the text on fake news <laughs> and about how information is not neutral. And so during COVID and during Black Lives Matter, uh, we made this work as a kind of homage, but also this sense of us um, being able to be surrounded by, by these theories that gradually... Um, uh, construct themselves. You can see that there are line by line, this entire artwork uh, is creating um, Stuart Hall's work. And uh, and you can see also there's, there's 3D tracking. So as the person walks, the computer segments, and then the whole constellation of letters uh, follows the, the visitor. And then we do something similar with, uh, in this case, the history of Arkansas, in a trail um, that you um, basically walk through. Famously, Arkansas's uh, history is the Trail of Tears is, you know, 900,000 people, indigenous people, um, as they died, as they crossed uh, into Oklahoma. And so this is poetry, it's recounts, it's quotations from elders. Uh, we worked with the communities to um, make an artwork that kind of represented some of these memories in a, a ephemeral way. Finally, um, let me show you this. This is uh, a generator that we just completed and presented for the first time in Abu Dhabi. It's basically uh, a translation system that uh, has been trained with Finnegan's Wake. So we took James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. I don't know if you guys have read it. I tried a while back. <laughs> I thought 
it was funny. Uh, I don't know what the hell was going on. But I really, really admired the book. I, I just read that somebody, a group in Venice, in California, just read it and it took them 26 years to read the full text and really try and, and think about what's going on. And James Joyce himself said that he, you know, when people complain about the the complexity of his text, he says that he wants you to submit to it fully and give it your entire life. <laughs> So what we did is we took the Finnegan's Wake and conscious of the fact that there were no good translations of it in Spanish, we gave it to a translation system, which robustly and swiftly translated the entire thing for me. And it is hilarious when I started reading <laughs> Finnegan's Wake in Spanish. And then, you know, you just select more languages and all of a sudden, it started translating it into Urdu and into, um, you know, Hindi and all the different languages that are spoke and the spoken at the Emirates, including Arabic, of course. And then we made this this piece where you can literally choose from any of these 24 languages and hear these avatars tell you Finnegan's Wake. So let me just play you that so that you can hear it for a little bit. Ancient from the ages of the Agapaminites, he is melted in our midst, sorrowfully count on the en valley. So Donc that means repas est annulé pour ce man. Sorry, Schlies and good Yet may we not still be able to see the form of the form of the form of the form of so among the things that I love about this particular um, example is with the AI, not only is it trying, not only is it trying to keep the content uh, the best that it can with all the neologisms and so on of Finnegan's Wake, but it's also got the tempo. There's a tempo where they all are quiet at the same time, and then they can come in and out, um, but they try and keep the meter of the piece. And that's something that I wonder what Joyce would have said about, because I think especially with more poetic texts, there's a certain texture and a certain rhythm that is kept, that is a, like an incantation. And of course, that this incantation is uh, presented by these avatars that try and represent diversity and try and represent a, a, a friendly, but at the same time, knowledgeable and reasonable um, presentation of something as wacky and crazy as Finnegan's Wake, I think is a really uh, robust juxtaposition. So anyways, this is a, a piece that is currently in view in my exhibition translation island in uh, in Abu Dhabi. And this is just you're seeing the behind the scenes. This is actually these big boats that um, Abra boats that actually speak the 24 languages. And that's uh, that's my presentation. I'll stop sharing. So I have some more questions and thoughts, but I also see a question that just came in from uh, one of the attendees that I, I think makes a lot of sense to maybe talk about right now uh, yeah. with respect to this last section, which was, um, what are the specific risks of an algorithmic state for the future? Well, we we can list so many, right? Like the the risks, they're already in play. So the simplest is, you know, manipulation, manipulation mm -hmm. of public opinion. The second coming of Donald Trump, that would be like the very, very concrete example of how algorithmically we can drive an entire nation, no matter how powerful it is, into taking a choice um, that has been curated and that has been funded and that has been willed uh, by um, by very specific interests. Um, the oligarchs um, in the United States are busy spending time talking about things like crypto because mm -hmm. people who are democratic socialists like myself, we like antitrust legislation. We like the commons. We like accessible education and healthcare. And the oligarchs, so say, take Zuckerberg, right? Um, 
he himself understands with some of his Russian money and other money that he has received that the, mm. the immense power that he has in, um, in his pocket could, for example, make him the president of the United States. In fact, he's, he's toyed around with that idea. And I would rather do that than, than have Trump. But, um, but that's a very perfect example of how um, those algorithmical excesses, um, you know, it, it can, can drive us into, into madness. Uh, there's many, the many that I've uh, also, I'm sure you have too, that we all uh, have, have heard and talk about and think about, I know you have a very particular st uh, stance on it, is um, the creative process. And, you know, is AI ever going to be able to completely, you know, take over, take out the creative process? And you have a very beautiful, I think, um, reaction or response to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it's going to, it's going to try. I mean, okay. I think that, that, you know, I, I agree with that meme that goes around saying, you know, AI should be used for tedious, laborious uh, kind of slave work instead of trying to recreate music and, and writing. That's that's what we're trying to make time <laughs> for all of us to do, to be able to be creative. So that would be lovely if the, if the emphasis changed. The truth is that, first of all, all of this DALI and all of this um, material that we have is a massive smokescreen, right? It's a smokescreen toward the more sinister uses of AI. And, and there's nothing more sinister than a company called Palantir, who uh, just recently, um, you know, sponsored a show of, of incredible artists in Germany and are trying to art wash their name. Palantir is a company that weaponizes these algorithms specifically for cyber war and other forms of war so um you know so first of all all of these so-called creative uh, pieces first of all can be creative i don't have a problem with that i i think that there's always going to be a collaboration between machine and artist already is the case i don't think that there is such a thing as as pure objectivity or purity or anything like that. At the same time, um, my, my I have two two approaches to think about this. One of them is about erasure, right? So one of the things that I think that makes us very different from an AI, a potentially even conscious AI, is death, right? We die, and I think that this final erasure, the one that keeps us all. Um, so-called modest uh, when when we can um, is the big drive of most of the really great art in my opinion so Montaigne said that to philosophize is to learn how to die and I think that art making is similar we're coping or we're understanding with what is legacy what is trace what is a recording what's our, uh, our, our 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 contribution and I think that AI does not have that in that sense AI could best be um, kind of represented by Borges's story of the immortals, where you show up into a city that is beautiful and so ambitious and so grand. But as you're walking through, there's all these homeless people who are just kind of scattered around and you're kind of like, I need to see what the immortals made. But the actual city is unfinished, you know, and at the end, I'm sorry if I'm giving it away, spoiler alert, um, you know, all of the homeless and, and all of the destitute people are actually the immortals who give up on building the city. Why? There will always be time. And so there's a stasis uh, when you don't forget. Remember also that forgetting, and, and death is a type of forgetting, is what drives evolution. So if it weren't for the fact that our genes forget, basically they mutate, there would be no evolution. Uh, so that's also interesting. And then philosophically, Nietzsche talked about active forgetting. There's something about forgetting that allows you to move on, that allows you to take uh, stock of time. Um, so I, I think that's until uh, we, and maybe somebody will do it, maybe I will do it if, I'm, if I can collaborate with some scientists, um, generate an AI that is conscious of its own death. Um, mm -hmm. 
the art will remain uh, poor. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that I say is, uh, what's the second? Oh yeah, about unpredict unpredictability. So no matter how surprising the results of prompts, the spirit of um, an AI extrapolation is you're basically dealing with a massive average, right? Of the totality of the swiped content of earth. And um, these extrapolations never happen out of a true sense of unpredictability. They're, first of all, their responses to a prompt. And of course, you can automate prompts, but that's not the point. The point is that there is an entire field of mathematics called random number generation. And the problem is simple. It's if you want a computer to generate a random number, then it needs to use an algorithm, which by definition, it will need to use again. And if you were to use it again, it gives you the same result. So by definition, the algorithm cannot possibly come up with an unpredictable number. And there's an entire branch of math dealing with this pseudo randomness, you know, because randomness is so important for cryptography and for many other applications. So um, there, is, um, there is a delight in the fact that uh, randomness does not exist in, in an algorithmic state. And I think there's something about improvisation, something about um, this, you know, more organic um, capability to to produce and predictability that uh, also gives us an edge. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that some of what you just said did also respond to some of the questions that are coming in. So uh, seeing that we're also at time, um, perhaps death and forgetting is, uh, a good place to end, uh, Ishan, if that uh, parallels with your your schedule for this for this event. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, shall we also look at one more question? Do you think we have time for that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Because, um, yeah, it looks interesting. But just now that I'm <laughs> speaking, I was interested in hearing also a little bit more about the notion of erasure because uh, it came a few times and I think it, it has... Um, several meanings in your work. So uh, yes, death is one of them, it seems like, what you are uh, working on currently. But also um, each work that is about both collective and connective memory is also an effort for um, a resilience uh, against erasure, isn't it? Uh, when, when we... Because erasure is what politically happens to our memory and what I see in your work, that there is this uh, effort of keeping the memory together and then there is an erasure within the work. Can you a little bit tell about that, perhaps? I, absolutely. And, and and I can do that with an illustration, with, with a particular example, because um, in a really one of the, in my opinion, best monuments or memorials uh, ever made, um, the work of Esther Shalif uh, Gertz and Johann Gertz is the Holocaust Memorial in Hamburg. Um, in this piece, you're asked as an artist, well, you need to remember the Holocaust. Like, how are you going to do that? And oftentimes, what we go to is we try and create something that's very tangible, very you know, so big that you cannot miss it, so big that no one is going to erase like Millet is about to do to Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the best way to remember the Holocaust? And what they proposed is they proposed a massive phallic prism, black, that sits, um, that jets out of the plaza of the Holocaust Memorial. And people can come and scratch it and graffiti and they kind of mess it up. But the monument or this, this large monolith is designed so that over time it actually descends into the ground. And so if you were to visit the Hamburg Holocaust Memorial right now, there's nothing to see. There is the disappearance of these massive phallic uh, monolith and there's a little plaque that tells you what happened there and crucially you can stand on top of what you now know is this buried um, thing into the earth 
It doesn't mean it's disappeared. It's just disappeared from view. It's not blocking your panoramic view. It's it's giving you a sense um, of of time passing. So not I'm not advocating for us to have cultural, you know, um, uh, like erasure, you know, at all. No, of course I'm I'm saying that the best way to remember, the best way to create a memorial, is to evoke that sense of of disappearance um but i also i mean clearly that's just one example that i love i, I think that there are different types of erasures um practically i think what i was saying at the very beginning of the talk my my desire is to acknowledge that i'm complicit with that state of surveillance but at the same time you know create um create a sense that you're not trapped in here, that we're not monetizing the memory of, of the artworks, that this is not about accumulation and this kind of capitalist, you know, desire to to have this will to power. It's more like the desire to, to, to flow, to let things go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your quite an older piece, uh, Los Alta does, does that so successfully as well as a memorial of another form of erasure. That's okay. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's a better word than erasure because erasure, erasure sounds like a willed forgetting. And that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really good, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend I thought of that <laughs> <laughs> from now on. Thank you. Ishan. If we do have a little time, Ishin, should I take one of the one or two more questions here? Okay. Um, one is okay. With what weight do you put on your works regarding the ability to have fun for humorous situation for humorous situations to arise, as opposed to a completely cynical, dark, and desperate projection of reality? Is there a conscious stream of labor to provide this wing of humor in your work? that may be in contrast to the singular experience of desperation one is supposed to go through in so many works about surveillance. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there is a, a pattern. Um, I would say that, you know, making art is almost like psychotherapy. So there are the times when you are there to celebrate and to interrupt the madness and try and create a shared experience. And uh, I often make artworks that are playful or funny because I, you know, I think we need that. I think that play is a very serious thing. And I, I take it seriously that people enjoy themselves. I get into trouble sometimes because my work is not seen as, uh, well, it's seen as too popular or like too, uh, the New York Times called me the um, death loving crowd pleaser. And, uh, you know, I do want to please the crowd and I do want to think about death. Um, but there are also times when, you know, you are also a citizen and as a citizen, you react to what you're seeing. And at those times or when I get a commission to do a memorial, I'm doing now a memorial for the victims of the Mexico City earthquake. You, you, you got to be very serious about this. You are, you are given the privilege of being able to, to think with communities on how best to remember their loss. And so, yeah, I, I would say that art should allow you to do, you know, to be moody. <laughs> Your work me. reminds me a lot of a, a chapter of an Italo Calvino book. It was a series of his lectures. And um, there's a chapter on lightness. And he talks about that there's not all, not only a lightness of frivolity, but like a lightness that is incredibly weighty. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of artists that I think are you know, uh, uh, have that unique sweet spot of being able to kind of have this meaningfulness in uh, by way of a work that also has lightness to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think across the board, you're super successful with that. Mm. Oh, thank you. I, I like I, I always think about insignificance too, like uh, especially with scale. Uh, when you're thinking about, you know, how little we are in the right. universe, you know, and then how significant is to be aware of that insignificance. 
<laughs> right? Like, uh, that's really important. It's like, oh, we're nothing. Uh, I come from a tradition also of, I mean, in Mexico, we, we have a lot of artists who are messianic, who mm -hmm. pretend to have all the answers and whatever. I, I'm just a guy. Like, I'm, I don't, I don't see myself as having like a program or 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 so on. I it, I take my work extremely seriously, but it's not teleological. I don't I don't have an agenda that I know where I'm going. I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, perhaps we'll take one last question. Um, also, I do think you know what you're doing. Uh, okay, <laughs> what is your process of material exploration like? How do you navigate working with different technologies and what are some challenges that you have faced over the years? So um, about 50% of the work that we do at the studio is bottom up. In other words, um, I have a team. So I work in a team of 24 people at my studio in Montreal. They are very diverse. They come from 10 countries. Half of us are scientists. I myself have a chemistry degree. Um, but we have engineers, programmers, industrial designers, and then we also have composers or artists or or uh, ceramicists and so on. And then we we basically produce a piece uh, bottom up, meaning, for example, somebody shows me what Navier Stokes algorithm does, which is this beautiful fluid dynamic algorithm that shows you how liquids or gases dissipate in in air. And out of that, out of learning what this algorithm can do, many projects have come out from that algorithm. So what we're doing is secondary to the actual, you know, fluid dynamics that that inspire the work. And then 50% of the work is top down. Um, I'm given a commission to do a memorial um, and then I study um, this memorial and I work a bit like a parasite. I, I, I learn what is the limits of the hosting institution or the budget or the scale. And then I work backwards to try and fit something inside of that. And then we may de develop technology for that vision, but it is really 50-50. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are now about 15 minutes over time. And it's always hot, hard to stop a conversation with you because you're so inspiring and you have so much to say. We could continue to talk for the rest of the day. But <laughs> I think that uh, it probably is time to call it. And thank you so much for your time, Rafa. It's my pleasure. It an awesome conversation as always. And to Ishan for inviting us both to be here today. It was a real honor. Thank you thank so you much. much. And look I, at my, I'll show you my coffee cup. It's, I was trying uh, to figure out who that was. Is it Celine Dion? It's Celine. Oh, so you Montreal. You know, talking about <laughs> talking about AI. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, was, it was such an honor and such a pleasure to have you both here. And I look forward to our further conversations about this, although that we are uh, finishing the public conversation right now. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Bye.